and something I'm wondering, you, you mentioned family farm defenders, and um, so I want to kind of jump off from Wisconsin and talk more about kind of global work that you've done. Um, but in, in 1994, you were part of a group that started Family Farm Defenders. Um, and through that group um, and the National Family Farm Coalition, which is an umbrella, um, you've built international solidarity through another larger international network called Via Campesina, which is an international network of peasant farmers. Um, and, and you've started to call yourself a peasant farmer and refer to yourself in the terms that Via Campesina has proposed. Um, so I want to ask you about one of the groups that you've interacted with through uh, these travels, um, and that's the Landless Workers Movement, or the MST, in Brazil. Uh, that you've been to Brazil several times and met these, met these um, organizers in other, uh, in other countries throughout the world. So can you tell me a little bit about um, your experiences with MST and how they've influenced you? They are a group of people that in Brazil that went through bloodshed to occupy unused land uh, that big landowners in Brazil took over and most of it was stolen from indigenous people through land grabbing and it, it laid idle they had so much and they had so many privileges it was not producing so these people simply simply took over settled on their own land actually and uh, they were so well organized in, in what they did over the time that they finally were recognized by the government if they went through a year and a half of living in a plastic camp dirt only dirt for floor uh, and it was everything was in plastic I've been there I've been through the, through uh, they're impressive from the beginning how they had to go through this for a year or, year, or, or two years, year and a half or two years to be able to work together. And if they could s s live in this plastic camp and the men worked if, when they could or the women and brought back money and water was hauled in. I know that was another thing that always sticks in my mind. It was hot, it was under the trees and uh, a man came out of, and set a chair under the tree and brought me a, a glass of lukewarm water. That was a, it was like giving me a million dollars because that's all he had to offer. But it, it was so grand to see that. And then we went to where they had built up the communities, beautiful community centers. And everybody had a plot of land. They all had a nice house to live. They, they had animals. It was, it was diversified. And th they're doing so well that now it's moving I think 300,000 people have been resettled onto their land and are productive, producing food that the country needed. And now they're going into Africa to the same model. But everywhere I go, <laughs> with a Via Campesina or something, and they've been visiting us many times. And so we organize tours of our farms and local entrepreneurs and things that work and some things that don't work. <laughs> and so they've been just an, a big inspiration, but I have to say that it started with the bovine growth hormone. How many are aware of the bovine growth hormone? The first genetically engineered products that entered the food chain. Well, they came to us 30, no, 27 years ago in University of Wisconsin and had a, uh, a gathering of scientists and telling us that farmers are not smart enough to understand it. That's a mistake. Some of them aren't, but most of them are. And uh, that it would put another third of us out of business because there would be a third of more milk produced. And uh, so we, we could not get attention of the press because one half of all the dairy products served at the University of Wisconsin in their cafeteria, even a big university mm -hmm. hospital came from that experimental herd and the people did not know it. And so you could not get press. So I thought, oh, I have to do like all these protests we did in the civil rights era in Mississippi. So I got a crude sign and 
that uh, do you aware are you aware that you're all guinea pigs uh, uh, for this product and uh, and I had handouts that were pretty crude at first and uh, stood in front of the Memorial Union it's the biggest uh, concentration of, of students and faculty and staff and uh, immediately we had international attention uh, there were cameras all over because I of this information and the fact we were standing up to it. And so within six months, I was invited to go on a 10 month, or 10 month, 10 day tour of Europe and speak on this. And the uh, people, the farmers and the others, see in the meantime, they had decided not to, to allow it in Europe. And they said, it was so exciting to see the farmers marching on the university. I said, here I am. <laughs> <laughs> so they saw all these students and all these other people. And it, it was a big crowd. And so if you don't even know what you're doing sometimes, it, it works. But. <laughs> so that's how that got going. And so then uh, Family Farm Defenders, NFFC would not did not accept it until the Family Farm Defenders was until the Family Farm Defenders and myself had to practically drag them kicking and screaming to uh, ac accept that you need to fight these things and, and look at what they're doing and who's paying for it. Follow the money. So that, that's the way it went. And, and just to, to be clear, because I know sort of the organizational names can get confusing sometimes when you're hearing a lot for the first time, Via Campesina is the international network, and that's how John ended up in Brazil and in Europe um, through this international network of, of peasant farmers. And the National Family Farm Coalition is the U.S. Um, sort of representative or, or chapter um, of Via Campesina, and they're based in D.C., and that's something that John Kinsman's been deeply involved with networking on a national level. And then Family Farm Defenders is the group that, that um, John works most consistently with uh, on a regular basis, and they're based in Madison, Wisconsin, and, and some of their literature is, is available here today, and we want to be sure that, that you connect with folks from um, from Family Farm Defenders, and so they've got their t-shirts on or some kind of literature. Available. There's our executive director, John Peck, kind of going to corner. And, and so through through National Family Farm Coalition and, and especially through Family Farm Defenders, you've also done, this is, this is the last question I'm gonna ask you, John, it's um, about kind of your national networking. So you've mm -hmm. done a lot of stuff on the international scale in terms of kind of communicating and building with people, but a lot of the direct kind of solidarity and activism that you've done has been um, on the scale of the U.S. Um, you've sent farm, you, you've sent farm equipment down to farmers in the south after Hurricane Katrina. And most recently, you've been working um, on sending uh, hail, I mean, send, sending hay, um, <laughs> sending hay, rather, um, to, to farmers who've been experiencing drought in, in Oklahoma. Um, and so I just want you to say a little bit about kind of your, your decision to do this, um, this kind of direct service and direct action um, on the national scale. And, and I guess, you know, any thoughts you have about food policy and what we can do here in the U.S. on, on the, the turf that we exist on now? The uh, we, Family Farm Defenders became international, like I say, overnight. Because people, we had a message that was international. Because if we could see the connections always, and so uh, I've been to every continent except Antarctica. And uh, it's and th these people paid my way and oftentimes John's way to go to these international meetings. So I was part of Via Campesina when it was being formed. And I've worked with these people for. 26, 27 years. So, so, but um, as far as locally, uh, this is an example. Um, I never thought local, my local people would ever be part of anything. They, some of them were part of the exchange program with the black children from Mississippi. And so they, they were comfortable then with people of another culture. But I didn't think the farmers in the other people would do anything. So I started 
or myself and my daughter and some others, uh, working locally to around food. So that was a common denominator. Everybody ate food. Otherwise, it, it just didn't work, it seemed like. And so we got the four, uh, four local churches that were in a cluster. They had peace and justice committees. And the biggest thing they could do was a bake sale. They didn't know what else to do. So we, we just went on with that and uh, was able to show them the seven principles of food sovereignty, which included justice for workers, which organics did not include. Uh, and uh, well, we've got the seven principles out on the table, so be sure and pick up some of that. And it tells a little bit. It's not updated. It, we, we formed the, the fair trade neighborhood. And people say, well, we're, we're a neighborhood. And we included urban and producers. And it was just, I can't tell you how great it got to be. Uh, it got away from us. Uh, I've done pole watching. I've faced shotguns in the South. And my daughter, <laughs> so has my daughter. And so after these meetings with our local people, the Amish, who are tremendous, are part of it. And uh, others, we come home from a meeting and they're going ahead so fast that we can't sleep at night. We have to think <laughs> that this is really working. So we uh, are doing a lot of local foods. We did a community meal uh, last Sunday, this past Sunday, for uh, in the community, and it was the biggest. It's the biggest crowds they ever get, and that's a monthly meal. We do it maybe two or three times a year, all local. And sometimes they have macaroni and cheese, you know, which does not help people too much in a nutritional way, or it may help them gain weight, but that's about it. And so. <clears throat> And recently you had a chance to go to Iowa, right? Okay. You bumped into um, our buddy, uh, President Obama, and One of you had a chance to talk to him. <laughs> what, what happened in Iowa? Well, this was uh, the, the urban, you know, the rural, uh, rural information, or it was supposed to be listening sessions, right? Uh, that, but there were about three or four, about two months ago something like that. And I happened to, we were able to get another farmer and I, Joel, who's not here, uh, able to get tickets or invites because there were less than 100 people there. And then all of us, half the staff of Obama, and somehow I had a seat in the, in the front, in the middle, and Obama's right there. I don't know how I got that seat, but we had assigned seats. Maybe he thought I should listen. But uh, it was it was good. They did they did not campaign like we expected. A little bit, uh, and then they divided us into into uh, workshops, sort of, and different staff uh, staff people, like Secretary of Agriculture, Secretary of Transportation. I was in the one with. Ray LaHood, Secretary of Transportation. So I thought there's about 40 people in the room. And I, I knew, knew that if I didn't speak up right away, because there were urban, rural, rural business people, and they all had coats like this on. And I was asked today, how come I'm wearing this coat? And I said, because one of my son-in-laws got too big and he gave it to me. <laughs> so. I have never bought coats and I embarrass my family, or clothes either, so. Uh, and so what did you say to Ray Lewis? Well, so I said, I said, uh, I, so I, I got his attention and the others and I said, I lived through the Great Depression. That was not as bad as this is. And I told him some of the things that I'm telling you. And uh, I said, I lived through a number of these economic problems, uh, downturns and emergencies, and I said they're all politically motivated. And it's, it's by uh, big companies buying the government. And it's, it's a long story. But, and I also said, they, they were promoting the FTAs, the free trade agreements, you know, they're to take over Korea, uh, Panama, and 
Bolivia, no, Colombia. Uh, and uh, I was invited to South Korea three months ago. And so I could say I was in South Korea just two months ago when I was there, talking to these people. It's going to put 40% of the farmers off the land. Don't you think it's better that we work to cooperate instead of trying to compete? We're competing with the whole world. How can we compete with China and India? And I know people from India. There are a lot of people, and they're just tremendous people. And they, like Vana Nashiva, if you know her, she says, we were self-sufficient, and, we, we and our population was stable before colonization. So I said, I asked the whole group, isn't it more important to make friends than try to compete and for the lowest, and that's what they do. It's a, it's a race to the bottom in prices, wages, and environmental degradation. And so there was a big silence, and <laughs> I could take as much time as I wanted because I, I had lived every bit thing I was talking about, and there was more, of course. And so they did not try to stop me. And so it changed the whole way that the conversation went. And a, a woman, a lesser staff person, mm -hmm. a black woman, said, my father's farm is being in danger of being lost. And silence. And then there were FFA, Future Farmers of America, that were invited, the, the uh, officers of three or four states, because that looked good, Future Farmers of America. You know? And so I was sitting next to one, and I talked to him while we ate, and then, <clears throat> so this is, well, then Ray said, well, we want to hear from you, a guy across the, uh, across the room, and the guy said, I want to farm, but I can't, because of the, the prices are so low, and the conditions are, uh, or the expenses are so high, and he said, and not one person in my FFA tractor is going to farm. Of course, they didn't want to hear that. <laughs> then the guy next to me <coughs> spoke out, and he says, my passion is farming, he said, and I want to farm. But he said, I can't. Not only can I can't, but I'm going to have to move out of the community. And they didn't want to hear that either. So it, it, there was a lot of good testimony. <laughs> so <laughs> meanwhile, my friend Joel was in, a, in another session where Obama came in. And he gave him the whole thing because Joel, you know Joel, was first one in, well, second one in your book. And Joel just gave him everything. And Obama stayed there too long because Joel wouldn't let him go. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the Secretary of Agriculture, Joel said, you know me? And he said, I sure do. And he, 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 <laughs> he took a long detour around me that day too because he, <laughs> he confronted them. So, uh, well, I think, um, you know, kind of to, to wrap up what, you're, um, what you said about emphasizing cooperation over competition is pretty essential, especially as you're describing all, you know, sort of the disillusion of, of farms across the, the U.S. and across the world. I, I wonder if there's just any kind of note you want to end sure. on, uh, stuff you have to tell these, uh, these fine people. Uh, we have the more information out there, but... The, the United Nations did a study a couple years ago, and uh, 400 scientists did a study of agriculture and food for the world. And it was ISTAD, I don't want to say the name, it's I-S-A-A-T-D. It's, it's a, a great group. And they were from 70, no, yeah, from 72 countries, and they agreed on this, on this, this uh, study that the only type of agriculture that will feed the world is small-scale, sustainable, organic agriculture. The only thing that will feed the world and cool the planet, because I came through three of, of, of big CAFOs, confined animal feeding operations, dairies, the people in the dark, because I had to get up early to get going to get here. I live how many hours? Four, five hours, four hours away. And uh, the, the owners of these places, the homes are all dark. And where the Mexican workers 
who milked the cows on all these big farms, they were up and the, milk, the barns were all alight, they were all milking. And so what I'm saying, this is a, what counts. And local foods, uh, if we all demand to know where our food comes from, if you can't find your farmer that's producing and know them personally, at least question where your food comes from. And it, 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 two women changed policies in Milwaukee. The one woman is on our executive board, urban woman. Uh, and they did. She asked about, does this, does this uh, milk or cheese come from cows that were injected with bovine growth hormone? Well, we don't know. Well, she said, oh, I'm sorry. We'll just have to go somewhere else and buy our groceries. Oh, no, no. I'll come back. And so they came back in a couple of weeks, and they changed their policy. It only took two people to ask for that. I've got a lot of other examples, but I won't go over them. So the, this, this, this study is important. The University of Michigan did a study also. And they said if, if, uh, if it was all these type of farms, small scale, organic, sustainable, all over the world were, were implemented, we could feed 15, how many, I forget how many more people. Well, anyway, I, enough people uh, till the year 2050 if the population tripled and they wouldn't have to have any more land. It would be 50% more food. And I know that because the farm I'm on was, all, was brown like this floor and some places wouldn't raise weeds at first because it was all rented out monoculture. And now people say, well, you've got rich land. That's why your hay looks so good and your cows look so happy and all this kind of stuff. Well, I said, it, it, also if you look a little further, it looks like Stonehenge too. <laughs> And the, the rocks are underneath, but when you take care of the Mother Nature, and uh, Mother Nature will cooperate. And so these big farms, the factory farmers, which aren't farmers, they're agro engineers, engineers uh, their, 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 their uh, crops, their output put is going down because they're finding now after 26 years that the bovine growth hormone is harming animal and human health. We knew that all the time, but all of the, the research that was done by these universities who were getting all this money, and when we took, did a freedom of information search, it just boggled your mind to see how they gave the uh, veiled threat, if you don't let us direct not direct, but directly. Uh, review, your, review your research before you publish it. You may not get the next installment. And so it got worse and worse, and so. And you all have, I think uh, John Pett has flyers about you know, milk-related issues and, um, and cheese prices, and then also they have flyers about that UN report that, that John Kinsman has been So I'll, I'll conclude, even though I've got about five or six more hours. <laughs> <laughs> this is my The sequel. And uh, actually, uh, Harish is going to kind of walk us out. And well, yeah, it's fluid, but I'll, I'll, come, I'll complete. I'll just repeat. Uh, the price of, of justice is eternal vigilance, and there will be no peace without justice. And John and I both had awards, peace awards, because of what we're doing. And we never talked about peace, but it, it's it's this kind of thing that will bring peace. So you're all part of it. And you all make a difference. It only takes one or two to rattle the whole cage. Thank you.